Luke chapter 20, uh, let's look at verse 45 through the end of the chapter, and then I'm going to um, uh, pray and give you a little introduction. Luke 20, starting in verse 45, Then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes, which desire to walk in long robes, and love greetings in the markets, and the highest seats in the synagogues, and the chief rooms at feast which devour widows' houses, and for a show make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we have tonight. Lord, in the uh, moments that I have here tonight as we open the word together, Lord, I just pray that uh, we are um, uh, ever more grounded as students in the word. Lord, we're going to take some time tonight to talk about the word. Lord, I pray that it is a beneficial time, an opportunity here tonight to be able to um, uh, have a, a better uh, confidence and uh, uh, may our faith be ever more grounded in the preservation of your holy scripture as we pick it up, uh, that we know that this is uh, uh, your word for us today. That it's made to change lives and to uh, have an understanding of who you are. And Lord, we want to be able to uh, help uh, to, to set that foundation and uh, to be able to uh, give some clarification uh, as to why we can have that confidence. Lord, I pray that uh, in the limited time we have tonight, you'll allow me the words to do that. Lord, I thank you. I ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Uh, I want to talk tonight, so we're talking about the, the, the God-given word, the fact that God has given us his holy scripture, and with confidence we can open the word of God and know that it's God's word. Um, I spent uh, the opening um, session two weeks ago talking about the inspiration of scripture and the important doctrine that that is. And so tonight I'm going to talk about the text issue. If you have my outline, you see that written down. We're going to talk about the text issue for just a little bit tonight. This could be an extensive study. Um, there are um, a number, uh, there are books in my library uh, that are written on this issue that are quite extensive. And I, I, I want to make it simple and just cut it down to what I think is the bare uh, facts of what we need to have an understanding of why we use what we use, why we believe what we believe, and why we stand where we stand. So I want to try to make this a, a simple um, opportunity here tonight to, to look at this issue. But the text issue can be a divisive issue. And I don't, we don't have an issue with this at our church. This has not been a problem. Uh, nobody has, uh, to my knowledge, nobody has ever left our church because we still use the King James Version. Nobody has ever left because of that. I have had people, I can think of two or three different uh, families or individuals that have left our church um, because um, uh, because they don't think I'm strong enough on the King James Version. And I'll talk about that a little bit uh, in the time that we have here. Uh, but um, I, I think this is an important issue to understand why we use what we use. The bylaws of the Cedar Hill Baptist Church state right in our Constitution and bylaws that we're going to use the King James Version in all of our teaching and preaching here at this church. Right? So it's it's in our bylaws, and it has been for the last 40 years. And uh, uh, we want to make sure we understand why that's in there, why we use what we use. So for me, and I think we would agree, I hope you do, especially after I spend some time on it tonight, the issue is a text issue, not a Bible version issue, as much as it is a text issue. And by that, I'm talking about predominantly the Greek text. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that tonight. I have know this. I have studied this. I've spent a great deal of time looking into this, and then this week, as I'm preparing for tonight, I, I re-studied it uh, and re-immersed uh, myself in all this. And uh, please understand um, where, where I'm coming from, and I think it'll be very clear in the time that we spent. So God has preserved his scripture for us. He told us that. We looked at that passage two weeks ago. Uh, God said his word would be preserved forever. So he's preserved it for us. The question then in the English language, we're talking about the English tonight, where? Where is it preserved at? We just read in Luke chapter 20, 
where Jesus warned his disciples and his followers there. In fact, he said it in the audience of all the people as he was talking directly to his disciples. Watch out for the scribes, the scribes. So he was concerned. We talk a lot about the Pharisees, a little bit about the Sadducees. We don't too often talk about the scribes. Uh, but they were the one, the third group often mentioned in those circles. Jesus was concerned about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and then the scribes. And the scribes were responsible for the, the transcription, the writing of the scrolls, the manuscripts used in the synagogue in the worship. Uh, the word of God passed down in a written form on manuscripts that were kept and then had to be rewritten. They didn't have, a, obviously, obviously, they didn't have a printing press and all of those things at their disposal, and so it was entrusted to this group to copy. So they had copies of the Holy Scriptures. It would have been, as we know it, the Old Testament at that time. And Jesus said he was concerned about them, and he warned about them at his time because some of the things they were doing were not were not above board. And um, he talked about some of the, the things there in verse number uh, 46 and 47. It, some of that was their character, right? What they were looking for. They were prideful. Uh, they loved to, uh, they wear the long robes. They want the highest seats. Uh, they want to be greeted in a special way. Meanwhile, they're devouring widows' houses and for a show, make long prayers. And so there's some character issues within that group. So, uh, that's something Jesus warned about as a potential problem. It was a problem in Jesus' day. And so I think we would agree that problem hasn't gotten any better in 2,000 years. If anything, it's, it's gotten worse. Scripture tells us that in Matthew 24, verse 4, you don't have to turn there. I wrote it out for you there. Take heed that no man deceive you. And so we need to be wary and, and watchful. And um, this is something that comes up a lot. Uh, Desi and I talked about this even this morning on the way here. Um, I, I find, I think you would agree more than ever, all the information that we see, all the uh, social media that we are privy to is manufactured, altered, adjusted, outright lies, deceit. I don't believe anything. You know, I just, I don't believe any of it that I see come across there. And so we are a more cynical society than ever before. And of course, we're cynical because of the misinformation and, and uh, lack of truth and lack of discernment that's out there today. And so we're, we're bombarded with that. And so I think we all have our guards up more than ever. There needs to be a warning that we have our guards up in, in Christian circles as well, right? Just because it's a good, uh, a popular Christian book doesn't mean it's a good book. There may be some uh, uh, false doctrine in it and things like that. So even when we talk about those that have translated the word of God, uh, there's an opportunity there. Listen, if a book publisher can publish their own Bible and make everybody that publishes a book with them use that Bible, there's money involved, right? There's money involved in that type of stuff. So we, I think we need to be discerning about that. If you were the devil, here's my question. If you, would you want there to be deception and confusion when it comes to the word of God? And the answer is, of course, Satan did that in the Garden of Eden. God said, thou shalt not. Satan comes along and says, did God really say? Is that what he said? Maybe he meant this. He immediately took the very words of God and twisted them. So I think we need to be on guard more than ever. All right, with that as an introduction... I want to talk about the, the, the text, and primarily there are two Greek texts that are out there that the Word of God today, all the Bible publishers and translators, pull from. Uh, again, if you go, uh, I could expand this and give you all of the history of it, but you'd all fall asleep and I'd have to go around. <laughs> it, it, it can be very extensive, and so just bear with me, there's two. The one that we are most familiar with is the Textus Receptus. It came from Erasmus. Erasmus was the editor of that. He's the one that put that together, and he did it in 1516. All right, he put the Textus Receptus together. That's a Greek text of the Bible, of the New Testament in particular. He put that Greek text together. He worked on it painstakingly and with great detail and with help. Erasmus from all of his writings and everything we know about him, 
was a godly man and a good man. And we wouldn't disagree with the theological positions that he had for the most part. I think we would agree with him. He came from a good, solid background. All of this that he was working on was primarily taken from the Byzantine text. And this was the text of scripture that was kept in Europe. A lot of it in Italy. Some of it in Greece. A lot of it kept through the church. Some of it even the Catholic church in those parts of the region. That's where this stuff was kept and held on to. And because of the climate in those European countries, it did not last as long as some other manuscripts. They had to rewrite them more often. They had to keep them up to date more often. They had to work harder to preserve them than some other ones, which we're going to look at in a minute. This is the one that was used in 1611 to produce, as we know it, the King James Version of the Bible, right? The English language. They used the Textus Receptus. That's the Greek text that they used. This was again used in the 20th century for the new King James Version. They went back to the Textus Receptus. So, unfortunately, those are the only two that have only used the Textus Receptus, all right? This text agrees with the vast majority of the copies and parts of copies that are available. And there's exact numbers, and these numbers were as of about eight years ago. So it may be, you know, uh, uh, more extensive today. But they had over 5,300 manuscripts, over 2,200 lectionaries. That was a book that was used in church where they would write out passages of scripture. Your pastor has a, a little pastor's manual that I use. I use it primarily at funerals. I use it at weddings. I'll use it for uh, outside services, like maybe a baby, a baby dedication or something like that. And it has the, the scriptures written out in it, right? It is not a Bible. It has long passages of Bible in it. That's what the lectionaries were. There were books used by the ministers, by the clergy of the day. It had long passages of scripture in it so we could compare. Okay, it's the same. All of those are, are the same. That's the Texas Receptus, and that's the one that we are most familiar with in our circle. Letter B, though, is, is the critical text. The critical text was taken from Alexandrian text, which was in Egypt, which is a drier climate. And I say that because the things were preserved longer. This critical text originated with Justin Martyr, and martyr, we have some problems with, a lot of problems with, doctrinally. It, it, he had taken his original manuscript and had written in it and written notes in it. And a lot of the notes in it were off the wall, doctrinally wrong, things we would have a problem with. I wrote there in number two, he added notes in the margins and at the bottoms of the pages. The legend has it, and so this is where, you know, we have to, there's some hearsay that he had borrowed a copy of the text from Antioch, right, and then taken it down and copied it, and then made some notes, and it looks like some adjustments to it. We're going to talk about that. Martyr's student, Justin Martyr's student, was Tatian. He further corrupted it and had some even worse thoughts on it, and then his student was Clement, who took it even farther. So none of these guys we would agree with doctrinally on a number of issues we'd have problems with. So number five is, is the key here, and this is what, what is the issue today, ready? The Alexandrian copies are the oldest known copies available today. So, other than the King James Version or Thomas Nelson when they produced the new King James Version. Everybody else that has written a, uh, a copy of the scripture, a Bible version of some degree, have gone back to what they claim to be the most reliable because they're the oldest available manuscripts from the critical text. And these oldest available manuscripts are these ones that I'm just talking about that have been in Alexandria, Egypt for many years, that's where they originated, that they were in the hands of some of these teachers that we have some problems with. So, and I'm not, I don't have, I did not bring this list tonight, but many of you through the years have said, Pastor, this verse in the book of Acts isn't even in my Bible. 
So we have a tendency, and listen to me carefully, I'm, gonna, I'm playing devil's advocate here, right? We have a tendency to say, look, these newer translations took these verses out of the Bible. Because they're not in the Textus Receptus. Or they're, they're in the Textus Receptus, they're in our Bible. But they're not in these new Greek texts, and so they don't even put them in their, their Bible translations. So we say, oh, they took them out. They say, we have older copies. You all put them in. You add it. You see the, 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 the divide? You see the problem? So there has to be some confidence there in where they came from, in who had them, and where they've originated from. And so I have, and our church, in its inception and through the years, have come to the conclusion that the Textus Receptus is a more reliable uh, text of Scripture. It, we like the people who had it and maintained it and edited it. We like the, the vastness of the amount of copies that are available, that are all uniform, that all line up the same. And so we have a confidence in that text. As opposed to others, and I understand their position. And listen, most seminaries today are just leaning the other way. And they're going, yeah, but this one's older. Well, older doesn't necessarily make it more accurate. And by older, it's not an original manuscript by any sense of the means. But they go, it's older. Well, older, but it was, it was with some people who had it that cor we believe corrupted it. And they took some of the early Byzantine text, uh, text and, and rewrote it and left some verses out. Verses that didn't line up with their doctrinal position. So I have a problem with it. So when people ask me today, they bring me different Bible. Do you like this one? Do you like that one? Listen, my issue is with the text. It's with the Greek text. And I want one that originates from the Textus Receptus because I've studied it and found it to be dependable. With that in mind, then, we've had the King James Version for now 400 years plus. We have seen innumerable revivals, um, uh, the Great Awakening, missionary ventures. Uh, so many things have transpired through the years when the church in general used the one reliable text. And I don't think we can say the same thing today when you and I go to a Christian bookstore, if you could find one, or go to christianbook.com and look for a Bible and find that there's like 58 Bible versions to pick from, you know. And we find churches today using a plethora of Bible versions to the point that most people in a more contemporary church, they don't bring a Bible because the pastor is going to put it up on the screen. And I don't know if you've watched. I, I watch other churches. I watch some of these other uh, uh, national pastors and things that they do. Uh, they, they don't use just one Bible version. They'll use four, five, six in one service. So people are like, well, I'm not bringing one. I don't know which one he's using today. I don't know which one he's using from point to point. So they just don't bring it. They don't have it. I, I think we've lost something in all of that. And I think that's a concern and a problem. I, I think we would agree there's been a number of studies done recently <clears throat> that the King James Version of the Bible, in its older English style, uh, is a more poetic therefore easier to memorize English translation. And the newer ones that have changed words or changed phrases are harder to memorize. And I, I will attest to that from this position. Uh, Desi and I both went to Christian school. Both of my boys' sons went to Christian school. And now both of my grandsons are in Christian school. All of us had verses to memorize. 
when I was in school, um, it, it was only KJV. That's all they had. And so all the verses I memorized were in this version. When my boys were in school, it started to switch. And they had the option. You know, they could, they, could, they could memorize in either this or that. King James or whatever they were using at the time, which I think was NIV. So the boys kept memorizing what I wanted to memorize, right? And today, my grandkids go to a school where they are only allowed to use and memorize ESV, which is harder to, harder to memorize just because of the way they changed it. It's just a little more awkward. The, the teachers have said that. The teachers struggle sometimes because they all learned it in KJV, and now they're trying to teach it to their kids, and they keep messing up words because it's changed. I, I, so I'm 54 years old. I'm not changing it, you know. I'm not. I'm not that smart. I, I got to keep doing this this morning. This morning in my Sunday school class, uh, we had one week uh, between what we had finished up um, uh, two weeks ago, and we're going to start something new in my Sunday school class in two weeks because I'm, I'm away next week. And so I pulled out a one-week video by Answers in Genesis. It was done by Ken Ham. Ken Ham was speaking. He was speaking on a biblical worldview. It was really good. It had a lot of great information. And in that video, because it was produced by a, um, uh, Answers in Genesis, which will produce our Sunday school material in multiple versions for us. In other words, we get KJV Sunday school material. But on things like that that they produce, they only have like one video. They're not going to produce every video in a Bible translation. So they produce their video in ESV. And Ken Ham is up and he's, he's speaking to a, a live audience and the verse comes up on the screen, and he quotes it in KJV, because that's all he knows, you know. And it's on ESV behind him, you know. It's a constant, it's a, it's a struggle sometimes, I think, and I think it adds to some, some confusion. Let me tell you a story uh, that I, I don't think I've ever told you before. Um, it's, um, hold on, let me get my years right. It's 1994, 95. 1994-95. I'm the um, Sunday school teacher at my dad's church for the teenagers. And um, they have a separate youth group leader, just like we do here now. I'm st I haven't moved at all. I'm still the Sunday school teacher for the teenagers, right? Uh, and, uh, but I, and then we had a separate youth group leader that did the Sunday night and all the activities. But I taught their Sunday school class. Most of the kids in our class uh, went to... Uh, I'll tell you, I'm not, uh, where I ended a few minutes ago is probably where I'm going to cut off my video. I don't, by the way, I do not edit videos. People have said that. I do not edit videos. I don't take anything out. I have a start, stop, and a, a start and a stop. That's it. Whatever's in between, it is what it is. If I mess up, if I sneeze, if I cough, if I say the wrong thing, it's in there. It is what it is. But I will stop it so I can give you an illustration. And that's what I'm going to do tonight. I went to Mountain View Christian School. My mom was a teacher at Mountain View Christian School, and my um, brothers and sisters were going to Mountain View Christian School. It's mid-90s. I'm the Sunday school teacher at my dad's church. The bunch of the kids in my class are going to Mountain View. It's the one right down the street right there. They had a, a teacher. They had a Bible teacher at that time who was very... I, I'm being rough here, but... Read over Luke 20, verses 45, 46, 47. He was very high head in the clouds, very aloof, very hard, very difficult. Uh, he only believed that we could read uh, and understand uh, or, or trust the Greek and the Hebrew. So he w knew how to read Greek and Hebrew. So he would go to church and open up his big Greek Bible and his Hebrew Bible. That's all we read. That's all we can trust. And he had started to tell the kids in his Bible class that they can't trust any English translation. And the kids in my Sunday school class are coming to me as a Sunday school teacher, and I'm, what, 24, 25 years old? And they're like, can't we, can't we trust the Bible? You know, Mr. So-and-so at the school says we can't, we can't trust any version of the Bible. We don't read Greek and Hebrew. How could we read the Bible? Aren't any of them good? 
That's what they said. And I took this problem to my father, because he was the pastor. And my father took that problem to the school. And the school split. And my mom and several other teachers and a whole bunch of the kids went over to Emmanuel and began to teach over this issue. Over the issue that there's no English Bible that you can trust. Oh, I, I, I do believe that God has preserved it for us in the English language. And I want absolute confidence I can pick up the word of God and that the Holy Spirit speaks to my heart through the words in this Holy Scripture. And I want our kids to know that as well. I want our kids to have confidence in that. And I do think there's a problem today with the confusion of going out and not sure what to read or which one's right or is this better or is that what? There's so much out there. You know, God is the God of order. And I, here we go. And who likes confusion? I said that a few years ago and a, a man and his wife left our church. How dare you say that Satan likes all those other Bible versions? I said, I think he likes having a whole bunch of Bible versions and making people confused. I think he likes that. I think he finds that funny. I think he, I think he loves to take the holy written word of God and make it so that people are like, I don't know which one to use. It's so much. It's so confusing. I won't read any. I think he gets a kick out of that. I think people have written them probably with great intentions. Please understand but I think he loves that he can make a mockery of it too. So, it's a text issue. We go back to the text. I am not, again, a guy, and there are friends of mine. Uh, well, let me, let me use this as my final illustration. I had a lady years ago who was adamant on this subject, and, and she told me this. Pastor, maybe I've shared this before. I, leave, I don't think I have for a while. Uh, Pastor, you should not say that this is the Bible, that uh, people should read the Bible. You should say people should have to read the K KJV. You should, pick, you should pick it up and say, this is the KJV. You only read the KJV. You shouldn't use the word, word of God. You shouldn't use the word Bible. You should only use the word KJV. And I said, yeah, I'm not doing that. Yeah, no. All right, I, I, that is what I use. That is what we use. Uh, and at the same time, I believe that there's a world out there that is dying and going to hell. And they're not dying and going to hell over the KJV issue. They're dying and going to hell over sin. And they're dying and going to hell and need the precious word of God to change their lives. And they don't need to hear me pounding the pulpit every week over what Bible version you're, you're reading or not reading. What they need to hear is the word of God. I'm going to use the one that I have absolute confidence in, and we're going to keep it continuous and constant in our church as a as a as a, a foundation of what we're using and at the same time i'm not going to get up and talk about it in every single service some churches do i understand why but i don't think that's the main issue and i think we need to keep the main thing the main thing and the main thing is that god loves them and died for them the Bible version issue is something we talk about in discipleship down the road, not up front. And so that's, that's my position on that. That's our church's position as far as what the, the, our bylaws say. And I wanted to take one week and talk about it and give you a little bit of history on it so you can say, all right, this is why we use what we use. We're just not, we're just not stubborn and won't change. We have a reason why we use what we use, and that's why. It has been, listen, I looked. I think nine years since I taught that before, the last. It's been a while. I don't talk about it all the time, but I think it's something that we need to talk about from time to time.